Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, so it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, uh, Tausib Asan. Uh, Tausib is originally from Bangladesh, but he is doing his undergraduate at Princeton University. And uh, he, as a high schooler, he was in, involved both in the math Olympiad as well as the physics Olympiad. I think he was a, a camper in the math Olympiad and yeah. a silver medalist in the physics Olympiad. He has another uh, link with Brack University. He was actually an ST for one of one or two of my courses yeah. at some point. And so um, it's uh, without further ado, you know, uh, Tafsif is going to give us a talk which is uh, a blend of experimental physics, theoretical physics, and geometry and topology. Okay, so basically what like started our inter project is that in Princeton, there's like this lab called Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory and we are trying to develop, essentially we're try we do a lot of experiments there related to plasma, but mostly what we do is like we're trying to, we're essentially trying to develop nuclear fusion. There's a lot of type, lot type of like nuclear fusion path that we can explore now. Uh, generally what we're like exploring is sort of related to magnetic confinement, like tokamaks, stellarator, et cetera, et cetera. So 20 years ago, my professor Samuel A. Komen came up with like this idea called like field reverse configuration and it proved to be like really effective in like certain areas where we're trying to have like certain parameters that like need to be like super high. Like for example, like the beta factor. I'll like explain all of that. But like the main goal, like the paper sort of started as like a way of developing a sort of design for like this FRC and it sort of became a paper on like topology because it's, uh, you'd be surprised how much of uh, applied physics at that level is just basically doing geometry and these sort of things. And mostly I'm doing simulations. Uh, so let's start. Let's first talk about like what is like nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion, as you guys might know, that is basically just process where like lighter atoms comes together. They become like some not slightly heavier, like not slightly heavier. Like they become a, uh, they basically become a slightly heavier atom, but like the mass is slightly lower than like it should be, and that mass gets converted to like energy. So that's how sun makes energy, and we are essentially what we're trying to do is. We're trying to create nuclear fusion in like a sort of controlled environment so that we can extract like energy from there. So the main issue here is that like uh, we can do nuclear fusion. It's really easy. Just look at like hydrogen bomb, just blast it, and like you see like a lot of like just nuclear fusion just happening and like everything is evaporating. That's not like the issue. The issue is not even that like you need to keep the nuclear fusion ongoing. The issue is that you need to keep nuclear. You need to do like nuclear fusion in a way which is like stable and you need to get more energy out of it than you put in. So like there's like probably like a 12 year, bo year old boy who even did like nuclear fusion in his lab. So that's not that impressive. What like we're trying to do is we're basically trying to have like this factor called Q, Q plasma higher than one. Once that happens then like the world will have like nuclear fusion. Like there have been like a lot of projects for that like ITER. Stellarator, that was like done in PPPL and uh, many more. Like FRC is just one of those approaches. Uh, now, uh, these are, why do we need nuclear fusion? That's a good question. Like there's like a lot of way of like just, uh, first thing as you can like just realize just by like going out, it's pretty hot. Climate is like sort of like going down the hill. Uh, we're losing fuels. Renewable energy is like sort of okay, but like it's not really like, uh, it's not consistent and sort of, it won't be able to meet like the inter demand of like energy. So we need something and even if we did it, like think about it. It's like an untapped source of energy that's nearly infinite. Like you can have just like one gram of water and like even if you count like, it has like, I don't know, like some persons of like deuterium and like those things, you can get, I don't know, 3.5 giga joule of energy just from like one gram of water. Like why wouldn't we want that? We definitely. So uh, let's actually see what's, what, why we can't actually have that. Firstly, like, for nuclear fusion to happen, uh, two atoms need to collide at like, uh, a velocity that's like so high that quantum tunneling can happen, and those atoms sort of can become like a heavier atom, right? So to, for that to happen, you need like an extremely high velocity. Like, and you, like the temperature is like around like 10 to the power 7K, and, uh, 
And it's like, uh, how do you even do it? Like, like can you contain it? Like, uh, Sun does it by like sort of gravity. We don't have gravity here. So we need some like engineering so that we can do it in like a sort of flavor way where we control like the plasma. There have been like a lot of ways. Like, yeah, there has been like inertial confinement where like you sort of throw pallets at like this that like those sort of like atoms and like sort of try to confine them in like a place. Uh, that's sort of new and not tested. What have been explored a lot so far is magnetic confinement. So like think about it, like at like 10 to the power 7 Kelvin, what will like the state of the matter will be like? It will be essentially plasma, right? And what is like the essential property of plasma? It has charged particles. What do charged particles do? They move in weird ways when there's a magnetic field, right? So. The idea that people came up with, like I guess like in 1950s or 40s, like there was like uh, the guy who essentially founded PPPL at that time. And like, so PPPL at that time was essentially like a place where people are just developing hydrogen bomb and atom bombs. So uh, there was this guy who essentially came up with, maybe we can do it in like a controlled way by sort of introducing like a sort of torus-like shape, which we're going to call like tokamak. And that was like sort of a thing that Russians also contributed a lot. And uh, so Tokamak was like the first prototype of like our attempt at uh, sort of confining this plasma in a way where like this reaction can happen in like a stable way and you can sort of extract energy. Why a torus? Torus is compact and there's like, a, there's a really good question. Because uh, uh, if you guys know about like magneto hydrodynamics, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but torus is like the only shape where you can have a compact region where the plasma is going to be confined. Like there has been like Solo, Solo VEF, like I'm gonna like discuss slightly about that, have, uh, have proved it in uh, some like some of his math. I, I'm, I have like some uh, citations about that if you guys wanna like explore that's really like there. So it, it's not always just like torus, like, it's not exactly torus, like sort of uh, torus like shape. Uh, there's like definitely a lot of like, uh, like the shape is sort of like an ellipsoid with some torus shape, but uh, the sh uh, the basic idea is like it's like a sort of shape that sort of lets you confine the plasma. So here's the issue. Um, sounds all good in theory. Real life is not theory. Uh, you build this whole thing and then you realize, oh, there's magnetic field outside too. There's like all these like light waves coming out, like not light waves, but like radio waves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what people realized to their like, pretty much like it was sort of heartbreaking at that point. They realized, oh, this like really cleverly built magnetic field structure is extremely unstable whenever there's like some sort of perturbation from outside. It just becomes goes from being this closed structure where you can confine plasma to like basically becoming like some open uh, field, and then there's like. Uh, but then there's like some internal instability from plasma too, right? Because plasma is moving, it's also creating magnetic fields. So the internal structure sort of, you, we didn't, uh, we couldn't actually confine magnetic fields for a real long time. And th this is like one of the most hardest problem in applied physics as of now. Like we, there have been so many attempts and all of them failed. And uh, we are now much more clever because humans become clever as time goes on. And now we're developing like more and more convoluted and like more and more interesting things. And uh, like the best thing about like nuclear fusion research nowadays is that if you were like a scientist at 1970s, the number of paths where you would fail and number of paths you would succeed is just one. And there's like, the, the, the don't put all of your eggs in like one basket, right? Nowadays, if you're like a nuclear fusion researcher, there's like a lot of pathways you can take. Like you can go on like stellarator research, you can go on FRC, you can go on Spheromax, you can go on Tokamak. So there's like a lot of variations that sort of came up where people came up with like different ideas. FRC is one of those ideas. Uh, so let's see what is like a Tokamak. Like we're gonna like sort of discuss like a prototype like thing. So as I already like sort of discussed, it's uh, vulnerable like outside perturbation and it's like a sort of like torus-like structure where like as you're like seeing here, uh, there's like this sort of helical like magnetic field and the plasmas are sort of theoretically was calculated to be like confined in that. Like there's, there's like sort of like a banana-like orbital shape of like those plasmas and they're like confined. Uh, as you know, it didn't work. They're like, you don't have like infinite energy, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, 
And another issue with like tokamak is that like it requires like a really huge like volume for it to work. Like it, it's like uh, sort of there's like a this theoretical calculation that like once you make the uh, like the structure really really large, these problems sort of like subdues and uh, the amount of energy you get is basically like a cubic. Uh, it basically goes up by like the volume, right? But like the energy you're gonna like basically need to sustain it is like you require it in like a sort of like the ratio of like surface. So at some level you're gonna like basically top like the surf as like you know like cubic things go faster than like uh, square things. So tokamak is viable at like a really huge scale. And like the right now there's like a transnational like organization called ITAR who have been basically building this like one kilometer like structure where we're going to like see oh this actually works. But you already see like this problem, right? Like it's a one kilometer structure. Right? If anything goes wrong, like this. No. So, uh, how do you gain? Uh, what is the temperature inside the tokamak, and also what is the pressure? So it varies in like if I'm talking like electron volt in like the FRC that we're using, it basically right now is like around like 200 electron volt, which would basically translate to 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. Ish area, but it differs on like different tokamaks, like different design size, etc. So, but I guess what my question really is, uh, how do you attain that energy through the magnetic field? Or uh, by, uh, so, RF you, uh, so you basically start RF like, heating. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. RF heating. Yes, exactly. Like that's that's like the entire premise of like our like paper. Like in FRC specifically, what we do is like we have this called thing called like uh, RMF uh, field that like, I'm going to discuss. We don't have like this, you see like this, there's like this sort of like helical like thing going on in like the, in Tokuma, uh, in FRC we said like, okay, this helical thing, it creates a lot of issues. Like it's like basically extremely unstable uh, because of like this particle. And like it's, there's like this thing called like safety factor, like safety factor being like too high is like very, so in FRC my professor had this like brilliant idea that like, we're going to get rid of like all these like helical things and we're going to basically, but like now the question is like, how will like the plasma rotate now? His idea was like, why not introduce like some like outside, like actually rotating magnetic field, and like the, we're going to rotate the plasma using that, and so that's how we get like the temperature super high, and like that's like the inter issue of like the paper. We want to know like how much RMF can like the system take in before it basically bursts out, because like you you want like the energy to be like as high as possible, right? The higher the RMF, the faster like the, the plasmas can like go on, and like. Uh, we want to know like how much we can like push it until like it basically like a system burst out. So uh, this is. Excuse me, Are you going to explain what is or? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm going to explain. Yes. Uh, so this is basically like a normal sketch of like tokamak. Uh, it's basically taken from like DOD. Uh, this is like the ITER uh, structure that people are like building now. It's pretty big, which is kind of like a problem. Uh, and this is like like the people who are doing this stuff. Uh, the, like as I sort of like said, like the main issue here is this. There's like a really good paper in physical review uh, letters where uh, they some guy for basically like figure out that these sort of like magnetic fields they sort of like jumbled up by themselves and like it causes like this like problem and they're like it's not even just like magnetic islands where like magnetic islands is like a token of that like. Uh, you can already see, like, how can you like even begin to like confine like a plasma in this magnetic field here, right? It's so much jumbled up. Uh, so, so like, uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, how do you get the plasma? Do they superheat some material and then put this in the magnetic field, or the magnetic field itself is strong enough to like break down the material? you start with like some already ionized like structure. And because like the fact that like these are like moving and like charged particles, they sort of like trigger like uh, motion. And like in case of FRC where I sort of like specialize, what we do is like we create like this RMF like rotating magnetic field and sort of push the. Uh, I'll, I'm going to like discuss it. It's basically like a magnetic field that sort of rotates. Like we have like the structure and then there's like magnetic field that rotates and like the plasma that we have, we're like slowly like building up like the. Uh, velocity there and so like it's the energy needed to create the plasma. Is it getting the energy from the magnetic field itself or like? No, 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 no. Like uh, 
the magnet phase is like heating it by, yeah, yeah, yeah. by by creating acceleration in charged particles. And that's like one of the main issues, like you need more energy than you like get out there. So like like the plasma like the energy that you need to create the plasma is also there. And like in fact like uh, if you're like talking in terms of like real life, it's not just like the energy you're putting like the system. It's like the energy you need to keep the room running. Even and, like it's sort of like the in real world, like the state of nuclear fusion now is pretty poor because of like these extra factors. But uh, uh, more on that later. So this is what like a schematic of like the efforts look like. Uh, um, here is like an actual, it's like a picture of like the actual machine that we work with. Uh, as you can see, there's like a plasma going on, then there's like sort of a lot of like X-ray uh, sort of coming out, and ultraviolet obviously shifted there. But uh, generally, like the photons that come out is like uh, X-ray, and um, I don't think uh, a lot of people can see that because we are hiding the picture and also the computers are in the picture. Oh, oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> So uh, this particular picture, this is like the machine that like we work with. We have a pointer. Uh, you keep on this is a good point. Uh, so yes, like as you can see here, these like magnetic fields, like here, like they're like the baseline like magnetic field, right? This is like. Uh, sort of toroidal like structure like it's not exactly toroidal anymore because we got rid of like a lot of like those components it's like a sort of like radially symmetric uh, structure and like we sort of derived it using like uh, solo if we believe that Russians are weird names uh, but uh, and then what we do is like we sort of add like a small transverse field that's going to be like the rotating magnetic field and is going to drive up like this like sort of plasma and uh, we are going to like try to sustain it. Uh, one like thing you guys need to like know like for like the terminology is like what's like a separatrix and what's like uh, separatrix is essentially like uh, the border where so what what are we after here? We want to know like the region where like the field lines are closed versus where like the field lines are open, right? Because if like the field lines aren't closed, the plasmas like expecting like the plasma to be like sort of confined is just like ludicrous. So like this particular like separatrix is like the heart of like what we're after. We want to know like the region where like this separate like where like the like the magnetic fields are closed and like the region where like the magnetic fields are open, right? So as you can see, these magnetic fields they're like open here and like these ones are like closed. So like the plasma, they're going to basically like rotate like out of plane and inward plane, right? So um, let's go to like the second slide. And the main reason why the like, FRC was like sort of uh, a really promising new thing was basically that there's this thing called like beta factor. So what is the function of the you know uh, the perpendicular magnetic like the solar red Ah, uh, yeah. I'm gonna like discuss this. Uh, this uh, what we are using is like these functions here, uh, but uh, they're like derived by like this uh, professor right now, like called Alan Glasser. Ooh, and that's like the that was like the first part of like a work from my mind professor. Like if by Sam Oakman basically feel like like a particular type of like uh, transverse field keeps like the structure closed, other ones like are like sort of opens them up. So like the reason like why AFRC was pretty interesting was that uh, that the first step towards like knowing oh will this be viable is like checking the pressure that like the magnetic field will create and like the pressure like the plasma will create. You want like as high as plasma pressure as possible, right? Because you want, because that's, that has like a sort of like connection with like the amount of like the Q plasma factor. So you want like the beta factor to be as high as possible. And like FRC has extremely high beta factor. So that's why it's promising. And we're like testing out like new prototypes and these sort of things. Um, so as you can see, this is like a baseline FRC structure. Like the, let's like an iron uh, conception. And, um, this is the base, uh, here you can see like we're sort of adding like this uh, trans rotating magnetic field using like these coils. Like right now we use like antenna, but like that was like the initial like schematic. Uh, and that's going to drive, rotate like the plasma that's like going on there. And like th here you can see like the FRC, like the whole schematic, et cetera, et cetera. And so now like I'm going to like start discussing like that actual goal of the paper now that like the background knowledge is like sort of over. What we're looking for here? We're looking for uh, 
what kind of RMF, because like we already know that solid wave like equilibria are like extremely unstable when it comes to like outside like perturbation. So it turns out that like FRC doesn't fall into that because of like uh, some energy barrier that like sort of is created. However, we're using like RMF, which is like a perturbation in and of itself, right? Because we're varying it and we, it's like essential for us to know that like if this RMF basically like messes up the magnetic field structure from like being close to like open. So, uh, and that's what we're after. And not just that like we want to know like uh, if this opens up or like if this goes, we want to know what type of rotating magnetic field can like, because it's like magnetic, like, uh, magnetic fields like uh, as perturbation can take like varying forms, right? It can have like, it can be symmetric, it can be non-symmetric, it can have differing values, like it can have differing like magnitude. We want to know everything like where this is stable because we also want to have as high as RMF as possible, right? Because as the higher you go, the, the more temperature you can sort of build and like you can sustain. So, and so this is what like we basically discovered. Uh, R.D. Miller and Samuel e. Cohen, uh, they discovered this interesting thing. So this rotating magnetic field, when you add symmetric magnetic fields to like the system, the system opens up. Uh, you sort of start with like this like one magnetic field, and uh, once you sort of like go through it, you sort of end up in like another point, meaning like the fields are sort of like sort of spiraling outwards. So that means like the uh, you cannot really like, confine. However, when you like add like anti-symmetric magnetic fields as like rotating plasma, they are closed, and like they have checked it like with extreme amount of precision. However, there was a simulation. Like the problem with simulation is that like we know this is a qualitative statement. We don't know anything more than that. Like uh, we don't really know why that is like even the case. We just knew that that happens, and that was like the case for the last twenty years. So what do you mean by anti-symmetric? Um, so uh, I can see the geometry in the y z plane. Yeah. Uh, it is anti-symmetric in time. Oh uh, no, it's anti-symmetric with respect to z axis. Oh, I see. Like the main axis. So like, uh, what, basically like this is like the initial FRC structure. Right. You add this anti-symmetric structure and like um, this sort of, sort of uh, increases in size. Like it, this increases like there's like another like part which decreases in size. So we'll just focus on that. But like look, uh, even with that, it's always like coming to the like, same point. So I'm, I, I, so what I want to know is that those lines, those loops. Yeah. Are they magnetic fields or are they the trajectory of the plasma? No, they're magnetic field lines. And we want, like the inter uh, idea of like the thing is that we want to know for which RMF these magnetic field lines are like So, stable. you know, I mean, uh, and the, the magnetic field lines on the left and the right, are those static configurations? They're static configurations. So, my, so I know that we know that magnetic field lines cannot have an end, right? Yeah. So they they are they are essentially they have to be either infinite lines or loops. Yeah. Right. So on the left I can see there are loops. On the right you said that they're not forming a loop, or yes. are they just spiraling out? So yes, like you just sort of stop calculation here, oh, but they would basically go into spiral. I can show like a figure. So they're, they're basically it's part of a bigger yeah, spiral. Yeah. Like remember like that like uh, you do the part like sort of uh, eigenvalue like problem where some uh, lines sort of spiral out, some form like, that. that's basically, like, uh, like you can like sort of see here, I guess, like, if I can find it, uh, like see, they, they're like sort of spiraling out. You can use a pointer if you want. Oh, okay. So it's like, are you going to use this? Is you're holding it the wrong way? Okay. No, the other way. Oh. I'm totally dumb. So I got a lightsaber. Okay. So see, like there's like magnetic field sort of spiraling out, yeah, and, like spiraling in, and like but here with like uh, they're closed. Yeah. They're still closed, and like the structure is retained. The issue is we didn't have any idea why. Like it was just a simulation, and uh, the process sort of discovered it, and it sort of remained that way for 20 years. The another problem was that we know this qualitative statement. Like the obvious question we want to ask is like. What's like the strength of like this RMF like for which like this still this is like still true? What, like is there any sort of other configuration, etc., etc. Like, like we want to know all of that. And uh, so like let me go back and because there's like a lot of information. Uh, and so like discuss this. And 
So I'm gonna like now sort of start getting like mathematical and like actually down and like and like sort of just like hands on into like the issue. Uh, as I sort of like say the can, 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 can I just like one word of advice is that if you go too much into the math details, uh, you might lose the audience. So try to give more of a story than the uh, you know. I can sort of like skip over like the derivations, I guess. And but I mean, you know, uh, do whatever you want, but you know, it's just like uh, following mathematics over over a whole intricate mathematics over a whole. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's, it's a suggestion. Right? Yeah, definitely. I can like probably do that. Uh, so do like, like one thing is that uh, yeah. Uh, mm, so if you want to know if like a structure is closed or open, like. And like all you have is like some differential equations which tell you like this magnetic field lines point here, 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 here. How do you figure that out? Because all you're like having information is just like some vector sort of spread out in like a, like a plane, right? So one way to do that is like this thing called uh, Morse theory, which we will also use. Another thing is to basically use this thing called uh, to solve the differential equations you'll find like the exact trajectory you can have like a lot of differential. So what we did is sort of both. We solved the differential equation and then we started using like this like uh, sort of high-end like topology and like more theory. I'm, I was probably wouldn't have time to like go through them today, but uh, uh, we, uh, I just wanna like show you like what we have done here is fairly uh, rigorous. Uh, like uh, also like, uh, there's like R here, uh, which is probably wrong. Like this should be like just, uh, this thing should be just Y, Z. So this is basically like the, like the you, you've just seen like the solid like field structure, right? This is like the equation for it. Uh, you can sort of precisely say what they are using that. And this is basically like when you solve this, and like in terms of like field line equations, you get like this sort of constant here, and like you can sort of, like draw like contours of this and get like same like structure. So what is psi? Psi is basically for our purposes an arbitrary constant. But this arbitrary like different values of this arbitrary constant is going to give, give us different field lines. So like uh, that's and like but like yeah. So, you know, so okay, equation one is sub configuration of a magnetic field. Yeah. What is equation two? Equation two is uh, basically flux function of this magnetic. Field. So you're basically you're saying what B zero is? Oh, B zero is a constant, right? Yeah. B zero is essentially just a constant. Uh, for our purposes, like we're basically going to like even get rid of it. Okay, no, but I mean, yeah. So, so I I I don't understand the interpretation of the second. So way. the second thing, there's like two interpretations of it. One is this is essentially just flux function. What is flux function? Flux function is defined. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. And another interpretation is that your gradient of that. Yes, and if you solve this equation, like write down like dr, dt here, dz, dt, d5, like you get the idea. And like, like if you solve them, what you end up is this equation and like a constant here. And different values of that constant is going to give you different lines. That's how like level sets and contours work, right? Like you have. Yeah, you, you basically have some sort of a potential. Yes, exactly. Like we have. That is like the inter like that. That is why like shy was like super sought after in like MHD because you just know shy and you know like the, all of like the shapes and like there is this is also sort of like potential like the, the way they sort of derived it in like uh, magnetic hydrodynamics was sort of creating like a idea of like potential for magnetic field and then sort of deriving these things. So yes, like now you can like see here we have plotted like the actual field lines right, and here what we have plotted is shy's. Different val like like different equi uh, port by uh, what's like a word like equi surface like level sets of shine, and as you can see, they're sort of like line up exactly right, as they should because they are like if you solve this, you get this. Uh, there's an issue. How is the flux function different from the standard vector potential? Um, it's different because like uh, flux function doesn't actually have any meaning except for systems that are like radially symmetric. So if you want to, and if you want to like, for radially symmetric like systems, if you want to define flux function and like vector potential like in like, and have like sort of a connection between them, you define it as like flux function is equal to R times vector potential. 
However, like it doesn't have any meaning besides system that are radially like symmetric. And that's like the entire issue because when you add the RMF, the system is no longer radially symmetric, right? What do you do? Like now like the inter like this beautiful thing that we're seeing and we can work with is like all gone. Like uh, what do we do? So basically you can fall on the function for any radial symmetry Yes. Like any radially symmetric systems have like a flux function. If we're talking about like magnetic flux So so the flux function also has to satisfy the constraint that the divergence of the gradient of the flux function is zero. Yes. And, um, mm, but like, that's like sort of like, um, that's, that is like issue, like, but the main issue would be that radially symmetric systems are like, you never really have them in real life, like nothing is fully radially symmetric. And in this system where we're literally adding like a magnetic field in like y direction and like kind of rotating its value, like it's not, it's just like literally not radial symmetric and we cannot like use, have this pretty picture anymore. Now I'm gonna like discuss like what is like rotating magnetic field. Rotate like, as you guys know, we use the rotating magnetic field to essentially like drive down like the plasma, right? Uh, so they were derived by Alan Glasser at uh, a spill lens which will have zero divergence. Oh, sorry, not bad. Oh, my bad. Like a zero divergence and curve. Like just scratch that. This, this is like my bad. The zero divergence and zero curve. And uh, they, he sort of discovered that they can be divided into like two classes, odd and even parity. And like odd, I'm going to describe what's like odd parity. Like remember, like uh, some magnetic fields are like symmetric with respect to z-axis, and some are like anti-symmetric with respect to like, z-axis. The Odd parity ones are like anti-symmetric, even parities are like symmetric. So, uh, Alan Boucher fairly like, even like the first time, like the, that's why like the inter problem in Tokamak even like started. Like when, like the first time when Tokamak was like discovered, Alan Boucher sort of like discovered that whenever like the perturbation from outside is even parity, the interstructure sort of blows up because of like some other magnetic field that like sort of existed. And uh, Samuel A. Cohen also showed that even for FRC, like if we add like even parity RMF, the structure sort of opens up as you uh, sort of like saw like fairly recently, like they sort of spiral outwards. Uh, and we saw, and like it doesn't matter like how much low you make like the magnetic field, it's like a sort of like inherent uh, structure in like, topo like the system, in a topological like system like. Uh, so, we cannot use even parity magnetic fields, and we have to use magnetic fields that are going to be exactly anti-symmetric, and, uh, and he sort of discovered that they retain like the magnetic field structure. Uh, this is like an extremely ugly equation, we're going to simplify it later, but uh, these two equations are, the, like the first one is symmet uh, odd parity magnetic field and rotating magnetic field, and like, the second one is uh, even parity rotating magnetic field. And like this phi here, even though it's like just phi here is going to have like phi minus wt because in real life we're going to like rotate it. But for our purposes, we can sort of assume that the wt angle is like the, our like, uh, without, without any loss of generally, like the angle where it makes like wt angle is like zero, like we can sort of rotate like the inter-system because physics remains like the same. Uh, so as like all other, like all ratio, like if you add like the even parity magnetic field, everything opens up. There's no hope of like actually confining like the plasma. Here we can like actually confine the plasma, right? So why? Like that's a really interesting question. Like we we did all these simulations, but why? What why is that uh, happening even? And, so uh, this is a classical problem, right? Yes. Like we're not doing any like this is not even like a at this at this point it's not even like a physics problem. It's basically just like a, it's going to be like a math paper. Like it's basically going to be like asking. In this particular like math field structure, when does like the system opens up like and we're going to basically use uh, just topological like theorems like Poincaré half theorems and those sort of things to basically figure out like this is open, this is closed, etc. So, firstly, there's no hope of actually using the actual magnetic like uh, uh, like you, like that outly equation. We don't want to use that because in like in a real life structures the uh, wave number of the system is fairly low because we're using like fairly long wavelength. Uh, so we can just approximate like the K and we can get this. So this is going to be like the approximated perturbation equation. 
like uh, approximated odd parity RMF. Uh, and alpha here essentially represents like the ratio of like the RMF and the, sorry, uh, the ratio of the RMF with respect to the baseline magnetic field structure. So the higher the alpha, the stronger the RMF, the lower the alpha, the uh, like, it's, it, when alpha is zero, there's like nothing, like no perturbation in the system, like doesn't rotate, etc. Like it's, uh, and we want to know what's like the value of alpha for which like this uh, thing here is still closed. As we'll see, like the system has like sort of like inherent bifurcations sort of hidden inside it, and we're going to like sort of derive it. And like the basic thing we're going to do is add all of those like three lines up and like sort of like solve it. Uh, uh, we don't need to derive all of it, all of them, because it's like a lot of calculations. Just know that like this is like a this is two sets of differential equations that's going to describe like a few lines. So these are nonlinear differential equations. How do you solve it? Uh, we cannot actually solve it with respect to t. The inside, like the key insight you need to like learn here is that we don't need t. Like, why do we even like, need to? Like, we can like to scale up like the magnetic field with respect to like z and sort of divide everything by like z up here, here, and like what we're going to like sort of end up is like these sort of like equations, like uh, dimensions are sort of like taken care of. And this is like an extremely familiar like equations, right? This is just two sets of linear, like this is a linear exponential equation. You solve it, you replace it, you replace it, you get this, you replace everything back, and you get like this, and this is the new sort of like modified flux function that you can get. This is an arbitrary constant, and depending on this constant, the magnetic field lines is going to have different shapes. So like the basic insight is, every time you see like parametric differential equations, scale it. Like, it makes life a lot easier, like, uh, and, the, like, you know, like our work was like stuck for like a long time because we couldn't solve it and then I like realized that we can like just scale it and get this. And uh, sort of now I need to be like sort of like clear, like this mag like flux function, like before flux function had like a physical meaning, right? Uh, right now it doesn't have any like physical meaning, it's just like this like sort of weird ugly equation that's going to give us like a lot of information about like the structure of like a magnetic field. But it's not going to give us anything more, like it's just, um, and you can see sort of like when alpha becomes like zero, this basically becomes like the previous like equation, right? For flux function. So we know what we're doing is sort of like in like the right direction. And here, like what we're plotting. Here, this is like a magnetic field when we're like simulating it. And now we see like if we plot like the contours of like the modified flux function, they exactly line up, right? So this flux function, you can use it to sort of get all these like information here. and sort of arrange them in like a really concise way here. And you can do something even more. If you have a function, and like the function, you're plotting like these contours, and you want to ask like, why is like the function closed? Uh, you can like basically ask like, why, where does like the function have like its peak? Where is like the saddle points? Where are like the local minima, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Whenever there's like some peak in like the function, essentially modified flux function, we're going to have closed field lines, closed field lines, right? And and for um, the system here is like a bit more complicated because there's not just like isolated critical points. There's going to be like a lot of like uh, degenerate critical points, and that's going to make uh, make things like, like so life like a lot like. Uh, more so you have the critical points would be where the circles converge, right? Yes, but there's like a hidden critical point here, right. like the like a line of critical point, like as you can sort of see, right? And that's going to make like life a lot like harder. Like I, uh, when we first like sort of like had like the idea of like this paper, we're like, oh, like we did all everything, and then we realized that there's like a it's more a ridge. Yeah, and uh, this this design critical point sort of make it sort of really hard and tricky to use like Poincaré theorems and those like basic topological like theorems that we know, and uh, so we have to be like more careful about that. Uh, so. The critical points, like that we're going to first talk, find all the critical points in the system. Um, anything about like topology and like close and open, uh, like the first thing you should do is like check like the critical points. Uh, you can easily like how you do it, take the gradient of like the flux function, and without going to like too much math, you can like just basically see, oh, this thing, right? 
they will basically give you the zero gradient, right? So they are definitely uh, like a type of like critical function. Like they're they're definitely type of sorry not critical function, critical point. And uh, but like the critical point here is going to be like a line, uh, which is going to be parallel to like z axis because no matter what value of z you put in here, as long as y is equal to alpha k z square, is going to always be zero. And the second type of critical point you basically find out by like setting like uh, sort of doing like a calculation, and these are like the other two critical points. So if we go back, like because math is like just hard to visualize. Like the first critical points would be like this, like like see like this thing sort of going on here, right? They would be like the first sort of degenerate critical point, like the line here, uh, and like the I saw like the second type of critical point would be like this like O point and this O point, right? Now what we're like want like now we kind of actually like know why the system actually have closed field lines, right? Because if this if we can mathematically show that these like critical points have sort of, you, you know like the mass of like Haitian where you sort of know that this is a local maxima and this is a local maxima. If you can prove that they are indeed like local maxima of like modified flux function, then we are done. Like we have actually proved what like my professor actually like found in simulation because then like this few lines around it is going to be closed. Uh, and that's essentially what we do here. We write down like the Haitian, take the trace, determinant, and sort of put in like everything and first what we're going to like see is this like and this is like a really so Tassi, maybe you can define the Haitian over here please. okay so uh, if you have like a flux function sorry not flux function like any function uh, the Haitian would be defined as like let's say like the function def uh, sort of depends on two variables x and y okay uh, then like the Haitian would be essentially this So it's the matrix of second derivatives. Yes, exactly. And uh, there's like a lot of like uh, background math here, but like we don't need to go into all of that. The reason why Haitian is in. Uh, from the definition you gave, uh, the identity of the flux function, so in the critical points of the flux function, the identity of the zero, it's Yes, like the critical points, if they're exactly, they have yeah, to be zero. They have to be zero yes. at those critical points. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, because otherwise, like, uh, why would like a thing rotate around like a point which is not like like where like the magnetic field is not zero, right? Because you will have like a value here and a value here, and you sort of approach it, and like if they're not zero, then you're going to have contradiction at that point. So uh, the reason why Haitian is like really helpful in like sort of describing this thing is because Haitian is essentially like a generalization of second derivative. So if second derivative is like of something is negative, it's like a minima. Second derivative of something is positive, it's like. So, like I probably messed up, but like you get the idea. Like you guys know, like calculus, like one one. And uh, here, it's like sort of trickier because in Haitian, there's like a lot of like uh, the, the the conditions are not really that uh, uh, simple. There's like uh, first you check the determinant of the system, uh, determinant of like the Haitian of like at like a certain point. Let's say this. If the determinant is zero. We don't know anything about like the points. Like they can be, they are generally called like degenerate critical points, where you don't really know if they're like local minima, maxima, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're they're essentially like sort of like uh, non-isolated, like sort of like, like they sort of form like a manifold in general. Uh, uh, if determinant is sort of less than zero, then like the Haitian is called semi-definite. Uh, are they called semi-definite? Like they're called like pro, uh, positive definite, right? And uh, if like a thing is like positive definite, then it's like a local maxima. And if like uh, reverse, then it's like a local minima. So the issue that we're going to like basically, oh no, 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 they're not local minima. It's like that, that's uh, my bad. So determinant being zero basically tells you that the points you're like handling are either local minima or maxima. So you basically distinguish between them by checking the trace if the trace is bigger than zero, then the uh, point you're dealing with is like a local minima. If the trace is bigger, like 
yeah, like the opposite, then like it's like a little maximum, like you get the idea. However, if like the determinant is, sorry, sorry, I, uh, I'm like messing up way too much. Uh, this is like basically, if the determinant is greater than zero, then like these things are like true. Uh, but otherwise, what was it? Would you, would you have like a saddle point otherwise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically like the point is you check like the determinant. Because if, uh, for, uh, Right, yeah. Like the determinant, like, uh, in like, if like the determinant is, uh, let me like this check. Uh, essentially, if like the determinant has uh, positive, uh, then they're going to be either local minima or maxima. Otherwise, the, or no, 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 no. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, of several variables, this is a very simple lesson. Yeah, I, I probably like the science, like, it's basically like, I, once. Uh, either like negative is like basically uh, going to give you like local minima and maxima, and like the opposite is going to give you like saddle points. But, but, but like the, I guess. Uh, saddle I points for being I think it's zero. Uh, no, 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 saddle point is not like zero. Like, if like you determine negative, right? Negative. I don't know. Uh, suppose we have a saddle point, so if you go in the x direction, uh, you know, it's like this. Y direction is like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so x direction, second derivative will be positive. Y direction and secondary would be negative, and if yeah. you look at take the determinant, then we would get another negative. Yeah, because they are going to have different uh, yeah, negative or differing yeah. I, I eigenvalues. Yeah. So so then so that so the he, the determinant of the Hessian being yeah. negative yeah. is a yeah. saddle yeah. point. There's like uh, some more theory like thing like probably. I don't know. I'm just like. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I actually have a naive question. Mm. A naive question. Naive question. Oh yeah. Like, uh, can you just explain the functional critical points, like, uh, towards the limiting of the critical points, and, like, uh, how it's going to, like, affect your like, the critical points? So, like, like, that obvious, like, you have critical points, and you know, the how it's going to, like, affect the, your setup? So, everything that happens in, like, like, so like let's say like the critical point is like a local maxima. Uh, if you plot out like the, I guess. Can you go to the RDS slide and where you have oh, okay. the okay. Yeah. 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 This? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so you're asking uh, this critical point, right? Yeah, so I'm generally asking like uh, what's the critical point, like what does it do, what does it do, and like uh, you said that you have like, you have, like critical points at the middle of the point, like, Yes, these are degenerate critical points. Optimization so, occur at the critical points, right? Yes. You are looking, and because of that, you are looking for critical points. Yes, kind of. But uh, also because uh, we want to actually know like the position of like critical points. Because depending on that, we're going to actually discover like a bifurcation in the system. So it's not just that oh, the, the critical points will just like uh, give us a oh, these are like closed. Uh, but yes, essential because the critical points is going to give you optimization yeah. and result comparison. Exactly, and uh, so if you're seeing like this, like sort of like closed lines, how do you know by like just looking at like a picture? Like you, you can like know here, but like I'm saying that let's say there's like some hidden variable here, like in like the equations. How do you know that like they're going to remain like closed and like open? Like you sort of look at like the critical points and you ask. Uh, are, is this critical point a saddle? Is this critical point like a local minima, maxima? And like, then you can sort of plot out like the contours, and you know, this is going to be closed around that critical point, this is going to have like an open X point around like the critical point, etc., etc. And if this, they're like degenerate, then you have to be like, uh, then life is like much more painful, and like, you have to cry for a while, and like, then, like figure out what like, is going on. But, uh, yes, and so we have found that like, one type of critical point is like separator line that like we're defining. That's like the first type of critical point that like you were asking. That like the line over there. Yeah. And, and this is like the second like a, the critical points like we discovered here are like the second type of critical point. So uh, and now we're gonna ask like what like how do you differentiate like why are you saying some points are like type one and type two? Okay, so as of now, I'm defining it because we just discovered type one first and type two <coughs> second. However, like the main reason is that like the type one critical points 
uh, have determinant of zero. So they are like essentially, uh, you cannot really just use all these theorems from like Morse theory and like you have to be much more tactful when you like apply them because all bits are off when it comes to like degenerate interpolations. We have no, there is probably like much more elegant way, but there's no like trivial way of like dealing with them. So we need to like so <coughs> differentiate them from like the already existing like critical points. So uh, uh, like the thing that like I was like probably like writing there, like sort of like write, writing it down. If uh, and yes, like here you can like see that uh, we have like written a like the determinant of like all of the points and like sort of define like d here. And like one thing we should do is that we should define like the d here and like we sort of like maybe like characterize that because it's like much easier to like sort of control, like sort of like much easier to like calculate. Like we don't need this. So. Uh, and we can like sort of like work with like characterizer and like say everything we want to say of like the determinant just from it, right? When it comes to like second critical points, because like the first critical point, like second critical points will never have like y equal to the alpha k z square, because like, that's like defined like as like the first critical points. So uh, as we can sort of like look into the chart, if like the characterizer is like less than zero and trace is less than zero, then it's like a local maxima and of field and closes. If characterizes like less than zero, traces less, greater than zero, then it's like local ma maxima. Obviously, closer happens. If characterizes like greater than zero, trace can have any value and it's going to have be like a satellite. It's going to like you know like that horse kind of like shape, like wrinkles. It's going to have like that shape, and closer doesn't happen because it's going to have like this sort of x like structure. And uh, if d is equal to zero, then anything will happen, and we will again have like another like degenerate. And like we should now like I'm like basically like saying like it's like critical points of first type, points of from like the separator time and like they're going to be like just say uh, we're going to like just name them like that's like the same. D giant critical points is going to be like as like we're we're just basically going to name all this thing as like the same thing from like now on because we have like sort of derived everything and know that they're like the same entity. And we're going to uh, refer like critical points of like the second type and isolated critical points as like a sort of like same thing. And now what we're like gonna look at is uh, the trace of like these like critical points, and now like let's look at like like you, like how to sort of like describe the chart, right? Now let's use the chart and see how and actually prove the thing my professor was like talking about. So this is the trace, and this is the determinant uh, of like type to like uh, critical points. So as you can see, for any alpha, sorry, I'm not ready yet, okay, the Characterizer is like uh, of like the lower isolated critical point is always less than zero, and the trace is always less than zero, and that's true. Like for like the lower critical point, that's like always true. So it's always going to be like a local maxima, and like field lines around that is always going to close. However, uh, for small, we can also say another thing. For small enough like alpha, this thing is going to be like less than zero for even like the upper critical point and the trace is going to be also less than zero for the upper critical point. So for small n of alpha, the both of like the critical points are going to be local maxima. And what does this mean? The field lines around this local maxima is going to be closed. And that's like the central premise of like the thing my professor was like start trying to prove that these field lines even when you add like perturbation, as long as like the perturbation is like small enough, the field lines is going to retain, be closed and like the field structure is going to have like the similar kind of closedness, right? So that's like the, in, like that was like the, what my professor was like trying to prove in like the simulation and we have proven it. And however, we have all this information, like what do we do with them? Like, should we like to stop there? Like we want to know more, right? Uh, like the interesting question would be to like ask that, okay, we have this like parameter called alpha. Uh, let's actually like sort of like knob it because in laboratory we can sort of knob it, right? Like we can increase like the strength of like the RMF plasma and like see that, oh, like something interesting is like happening. Like the plasma is like gaining like, a lot of temperature. So like let's actually ask like how much further we can go with this alpha until like this thing like breaks, sort of like breaks down. So what does alpha mean physically? Alpha is the ratio of the RMF magnetic field and the baseline magnetic field. It's like uh, it's basically like the maximum of like the RMF magnetic field and like the maximum of like the baseline magnetic field. It's basically like the ratio. 
like physical it basically like gives you like the idea that what's like the strength of the perturbation right. so and so before we do that though um, so the essential idea uh, in classifying the critical points was that we know that there exist points around which we can like construct close contours yeah and so we can eventually attain contours yes exactly now the, here's the thing we just showed that like the points are closed at just around the immediate neighborhood of like those like critical points right is that good enough because what my professor showed is that all of the magnetic fields inside the separatrix remains closed so we have not yet proved like the professor's uh, internal claim uh, but we can do that actually uh, so we have proved these two theorems in the paper I'm, not going to give you the proof, it's like fairly convoluted and you guys need to like sort of know what like point curve of theorem and those things are. I'm going to give you the proof if I can finish the actual like the presentation. But for now just accept this as like sort of, it's true, like just accept it. So like the theorem is that all contours except like the separator line, like the first like so, like those like design critical points, inside that ellipse, this like particular like ellipse is going to be closed. And all those like critical points uh, such as like two local maxima that like are in like the inside this like this particular like ellipse all of those like contours outside of that ellipse is going to be open so this is like really important you have to have this like two local maxima inside that ellipse otherwise like this theorem doesn't work and for once alpha sort of like increases to like a point this is not true anymore and when it's not true anymore uh, separatrix sort of like goes through like a sort of like bursting of like things and like that's where like the alpha sort of creates like a phase bifurcation and we're gonna like basically see and uh, interesting question that we can like also ask is like uh, what's like the length of the separator line that's within like the alpha that because like you basically want to know if like separator line is in the is in the ellipse right so uh, this is like the length of the separator line in the ellipse after a certain point, the separator line is going to be outside the ellipse, and like this is going to be imaginary, right? And at that point, you'd know, oh, like the separator line is like basically outside of like the ellipse because this is like imaginary. So the separator line was a long line in between. Yes, the line like the degenerate critical points, and uh, at a particular like alpha, the it separator it vanishes. It doesn't vanish; it just goes outside of the. Uh, I mean, it becomes complex. Right? Yeah, this becomes a complex, and like the separator line becomes like outside of like the ellipse. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, so this is the separatrix. This is like the uh, separator line, and you can see that once we add alpha, it slightly moves downwards a little. The the, the magnetic field lines are like here, like as you can see, right? And you can see that like the you know, actual situation in like the physical world also matches up with like what we're seeing in like the separatrix like the separatrix sort of like moves down a little like the equilibrium points like sort of like goes down like a little and uh, like the feel like the was like the, this separator line goes up a little like you can see that what we're doing is same like when like so far like the calculations are like sort of right so I, I have a question like um, why is why is this, this picture not symmetric around the vertical X? Because the we're adding like that argument. That's like the entire reason what we're like. So if I change the time orientation of the RMF, then this figure would flip, right? Time orientation as in like? Like, uh, your RMF is doing this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if I do this, like, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, then this uh, figure yes, exactly, would flip. Yes, exactly, exactly. Like, in fact, like, the reason like why we're like just assuming phi is equal to zero is precisely that right? we are just saying we can like just choose a direction in like the physical world because it's like symmetric with us. Like physical world doesn't care like which angle you're like looking at. Uh, I don't know, maybe like there's like some gravitational like uh, so these are like a summary of like what we learned so far. Like as we sort of, sort of saw that like the magnetic field, like a separator line that sort of goes up a little, like by this amount. Uh, the ellipse sort of becomes slightly small, like smaller, like by like root, like the circumference is like scaled by like root z, and uh, 
the center of like that ellipse, it basically goes down a little, and like the equilibrium points also like go down like a little bit, but it's like fairly small. Uh, so, so far we have like shown everything my professor was like trying to show initially, but we have like a lot more like we can work with now, right? So we might well just like use it, and as you're gonna like see now, we're gonna like discover like the central point of like the paper that the system has a fairly strong resistance to like RMF uh, perturbation. So remember this, like the characterizer. Uh, as alpha sort of like increases, the characterizer was like initially uh, initially positive, right? So once like the characterizer becomes like negative as alpha increases, then like that like upper critical point is going to become like a saddle, right? So and we can find like the critical like the critical alpha for which that happens by sort of setting like this like as zero, and we've done that and we get this. This is the critical point where like the system actually becomes like, uh, like the th like, it, like the what my professor thought that like is going to always have, uh, it's going to always be resistant to like RMF perturbation. We're like literally seeing that's not like the case. Mm -hmm. Like at that critical alpha, the okay. system becomes like sort of like an onion shape. Like we're gonna like see that. Uh, alpha critical is like also fairly important for like two other reasons. It's not just like where this becomes like a saddle point. Uh, that's like here. It's like uh, alpha critical is also like the value for which like separator line that basically goes outside of like that ellipse. And the alpha critical is like also the um, value where the critical point, upper critical point itself is going outside of like the ellipse. So like this is really important. Like so, when we prove the theorem, like the theorem about like what every contour outside of that like particular ellipse is going to be open, we assume a fairly important thing that like both of these like points is going to have to be inside the ellipse, right? So this is no longer true. Meaning the separator separatrix is going to be different this time, and this is a sudden like sort of like abrupt like change in the system and uh, there's like uh, there's like extensive proof of these things uh, I'm going to like discuss it if I get like time uh, so uh, we like, usually start. end by five so yeah I have to be like moving like pretty fast so um, uh, I, I guess like I'm like sort of like done with like almost uh, so theorem to no longer represents like the system and like the separatrix is no longer like that ellipse. The separatrix essentially becomes like a new curve and you can sort of calculate that curve by finding like the region where the a level set is touching the saddle point but it's also containing the upper like lower critical point and you can basically find it by setting like uh, this chi equal to this. And uh, so like the new separatrix is this, and it's not really smooth like an ellipse anymore, and uh, the change is sort of like abrupt, and you can sort of like now see the summary of like the entire paper. As long as alpha is like smaller than alpha critical, the local maxima, both of the, like the points will be local maxima, their row may be like saddle points, and like the region of closer will be just shy greater than like zero, meaning like the uh, ellipse essentially once we like solve it and here there's going to be just one local maxima and one saddle and the region of closure is going to be this so this is going to be like a boundary uh, level curve and this is what like the level curve looks like these are essentially like part of that level set but this is the border everything inside is closed everything outside of this is like open and um, now we want to like check the actual thing with an actual experimental data and see if our like theory actually works. So, so uh, sorry, what's happening at E1 prime, the green curve, that's a magnetic field, right? Uh, is that yes, a... this is basically like part of like the same shine. Okay, so there is some sort of like a pinching off or some something yeah. happening there. Yeah, so it's, I, I can like sort of like, uh, so you can sort of like see. Oh, I, right, 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 right,
So you can sort of like see, and like as you like sort of like guys like remember that's like how, what it used to look like, right? Now it doesn't. And now we want to like actually check what we're doing is like experimental, like does it actually match what we're like seeing numerically or experimentally? And it, as you'll see, it's like fairly close to what we observed like through like numerical simulations. And like the reason it's not exact is because we made that like approximation way far down the line, right? Like we made the RMF field like uh, we assume like k is like fairly small. Uh, so we want to know where like the transition happened. How do we like know that? We basically zoomed in on like the first critical point and we changed our alpha up to like a certain point where like changing even like 0 0.0001 turns it from like a closed line to this like open saddle point. And this happens at like alpha equal to five, four, seven, one, like for like the setting that like we're using, like with k equal to 0 0.3, uh, r equal to one set is equal to like two. The theoretical value is alpha is equal to five, 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 six, which is fairly close. And like it's like, uh, and like that's actually like, uh, we actually expected like, this is actually like a much better result than we expected because we're using k equal to 0 0.3, right? 0 0.3 is not exactly, Small, like and like, because. So remind me what k was. K was like the wave number of the RMF. So if we like, it's basically like we we approximated sine k z equal to k z, and k was zero point three. And even with that, we're getting like this like fairly good like uh, agreement. Because like when we make like sine k z equal to k z, we're not just like doing like the we're just not like approximating it with respect to first order like transition. Like the second term is also like almost there because it's just absent, like the third time it's going to be like k cubed, so it's like a second order approximation, essentially. So the reason it doesn't actually like completely agree is because like the kr, we need to be much, much more like accurate about that. And kz, uh, I don't think we need to be accurate about kz. Do you guys know why? Because like those critical points is on like the, how do I put it? They're going to be on the, la, uh, what's the thing called? Like z equal to zero, right? Always. So the closure and all this thing around like z equal to zero line, z is all like literally zero and everything around it is going to have extremely small value, like like infinitesimally like small and like, so kz, like the approximation is not exactly like an approximation, it's like sort of an exact uh, approximation that's like sort of disguised as like, oh, we're like approximated. But like the kr thing, we have, we had no right to make it like just uh, for second order like approximation and we, in like our future work, we're going to sort of explore what happens when you add like extra terms from like the Tyler series and like see what's like happening in the system. Because there are like a lot of things. So, happening. so the um, the Z was this line. Yes. And R was the radial line from there, yeah. right? Okay. So there are like a lot of things happening in the system that like we also observe when we're like actually like sort of proving this thing or like sort of like playing around with like the machine and like everything. And like we sort of discovered this. See, there's like this little like butterfly like like structure at alpha, right? At like k is like fairly high. Nothing in our like calculation predicts that like this will happen. Like there's nothing in the system. Like this sort of predicts that like okay, like the at that particular alpha, this thing will like open up. But this like notes. Nothing in our theory says that there will be like this like sort of like spiraling of like fields outwards. And like what do we do? Like how, like we sort of like uh, observe that app, this sort of starts happening when k is like around 0 0.8 and uh, this sort of like phenomenon. And we sort of like want to know like why does this happen? And like uh, what's actually like going on here? And uh, this is something we're like discovering right now. So if you guys like want to like, I don't know, message me, like start working on it. Uh, so, what like I'm trying to do right now in like my research is like sort of adding up like extra terms from like the Taylor series and like seeing so like playing with it and like saying oh like this extra terms create this effect this extra terms create like this effect and like I'm like here right now we're not like adding extra terms we're like literally using like, the exact RMF equation so what I did is like I'm like trying to add like extra terms from like the Taylor series and like saying if this is sufficient in like creating this effect so then we can like sort of like do another like analysis and like see if, like this is like happening so. There are more hidden bifurcations that we might not know about even because this is like this thing about like non-linear like topological like system. There's like so many things hidden inside it that you like 
unless you have like an exact solution which is like fairly hard anyway like you can never actually find all these like hidden like structures and like we want to know like what, how many like these sort of like bifurcation that like we observed like how many of these things are like there i also found like on one like fairly recently where like the even like the lower magnetic field structure never like lower uh, critical point that also sort of like disappears after like an extremely high alpha alpha equal to like 25 or something so there's like a lot more things going on and we want to know that like what's going on and like how what do we do with it and like uh, so if you guys are like interested in like nonlinear like uh, differential equations and like how chaotic system works or like topology like hit me up we can like sort of like explore this I guess uh, so that's basically what I like what really like so so right now we want to like basically uh, I have like 15 minutes I guess that's totally fine. Uh, so, so far we have like done this thing in like the phi equal to zero plane. It's, as you can like see that it's extremely easy to like just extend all these like conclusions from like two dimension to like three dimension and so like project them back. Uh, or write down like the baseline equation like this, like the, uh, if you convert like the perturbation it would become this, add them up, do like all this calculation, you would end up like with this like equation. If you solve them, you're gonna get like these results. And that's like fairly important because we want to know that those like things like uh, how can like our system actually fail here? Our system can fail if like the magnetic field lines doesn't stay in like the same plane. Then you cannot really like project them into like because what we're like doing is like projection of like all these things into like the phi equal to zero plane, right? So if like the magnetic field doesn't stay in like the same plane, then you cannot like really project them back and like know they're like closed. What we have like discovered is that they do stay in like the same plane. So they stay in like this particular like plane with y equal to cx plus alpha z and z can be anything so it's like sort of like this and uh, they like they sort of follow like this equation in that plane and uh, because I, I should like create like a picture for this but you guys can like visualize like planes so uh, the reason why this is like fairly important is that think about this uh, uh, can I like use this yeah. let's say uh, you have you uh, erase some of it. Let's say you have like uh, this thing, and you have this thing. Let's say uh, there's like this magnetic field structure that doesn't close here. If you like project it back to like this plane, would it close? No, right? Because then that's how like topology works. Like if the, if it doesn't close at like a particular plane, no matter what kind of like translations and transformations you do, like it never like. Uh, you know, like the basic like topological like equivalent transformation, it will always be like open. And if it's closed at like that particular plane, once you project them back, it's go always going to be like open, right? So this is the conclusion. Um, given that like this magnetic field lines do stay in like the same level, this is not true if like this the magnetic field lines basically venture out of like the plane because then it's possible that like they do close when you project them back, but like there's like a component that like basically goes out, right? So, given that they are in like the same plane, we can basically now say that the conclusion that we had are essentially true for even three dimension. Because all we're doing is basically just project them back. And this is how like the actual modified flux function looks like in three dimension. We can sort of like see the picture. I guess you can see this. And then you're gonna get like the field lines by taking like an intersection that, that goes from here to here, and here to here. And uh, in the paper that they published, uh, they sort of may use these pictures as like the central picture of like the paper. I, I wasn't like intending on that. But yeah, this is like how like the modified flux function looks like. And you guys can see there's like also separate here, right? Right? Like, uh, so this is what happens when you add RMF and sort of like rotate it. Now like the magnetic field lines will go through this, 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 and like there's like this axis and like this axis itself is going to rotate, so this like plasma is going to rotate alongside it, and it's going to be contained. It's like a toroid inside out or something? Yes, sort of, but like these are like essentially uh, contour plots. Uh, so like it's like a level set, like, so like the actual structure is like actually four dimensional, like so it's just like, uh, there's like, not four dimensional, like you get, you get the idea, it's like, uh, shy, there's like this shy, we're like saying that this is just contours of shy. Like if you want to like sort of visualize it, you need like some four dimensional like you get that. Yeah. So these are just level sets of like shine like three dimension. So we sort of like discussed it, and like the similar conclusion essentially hold like the even in three dimension they are uh, like the separator line sort of moves up by this, the center moves down by this, the 
everything is sort of scaled by like this like amount. And the and as I sort of like argued that the conclusion of like the transition sort of like falls in 3D. And I think we're done. Um, so let's actually discuss like what we have uh, sort of tried to Yes, you can, but it's like a lot more work. Like when you have like a much easier like. So I mean, I am not sure what's the process is the project. Like, okay. Uh, can you explain it? Yeah. Uh, why are we doing it and what we are doing here? Yeah. Uh, so that level surface. No, not exactly. Like think it like that. Let's say you have this like line in a normal surface. You're not doing any projection. You're you're sort of twisting it and you're using like a lot of like linear operation on like the surface, right? I see. Uh, so, so this thing here that yeah. we're seeing here, this is essentially like projection of like the field lines in 3D, right? Because we're basically getting rid of like the phi act, like the uh, beta phi, right? So if you're getting rid of like the phi axis when you're like calculating this, these are all essentially just magnetic field lines from like, if, like other pla planes into like phi plane, right? Phi, phi equal to zero axis, right? Because we're basically just taking all of like, we're basically like just getting rid of like the phi component. Phi equal zero axis, like are we calculating this field line in spatial like x, y, z components or like we're, phi equal to zero is y z component. So we're basically what we're doing is we're taking like the actual field line in three dimension that can be anything like z yeah. jumbled up. But when you project like that jumble, like potentially jumbled up, it's not like as I like sort of like show and like sort of project it in like the y z plane, mm -hmm. it's going to have this sort of closed like structure that like I showed. So you're getting rid of one dimension. Right? Yes, like we're basically projecting it and like uh, now going. Here. And what I showed is that like even with like the project, like the like, obvious question is that like, oh you're working in like two dimension. How do you know that like, like this conclusion from your uh, of two dimension actually holds in three dimension? That's like the thing that I showed that like projection is like a linear operation, right? So it doesn't change like like the inherent topology of like the thing that you're describing. So given that unless like the thing well, basically is strange linear projection. Like basically, it doesn't change like topology. Like, so it's like the word called homo homeomorphism. homeomorphism. Yes. It's a continuous thing. It yeah. Open set, open set. Open yeah, yeah, exactly, open set. exactly, exactly. Homeomorphism. And so basically, like what I showed that, but it's possible that like the field lines can venture out of the plane, right? So it may close here, but like the field lines, even if it shows that like it closes, it can we have that like sort of it's going outside of the plane, but like when you project it, it's like we're seeing close. What I showed here is that that's not the case because the field lines are in like same same plane even in 3D. So when you like basically project them back, it's going to close. But like you can basically now do it in reverse, right? Because you can just take this field line and project them to like this like particular rotated field line, and you're gonna get like this newer like field lines, and they're going to still be close because it's like a homeomorphism. So that's like what you like show here. So this is the conclusion of the paper. We modified like this thing called modified flux function. And uh, these are like parameters where, which we like basically desire. We want like confinement time to like fairly high and now we know the exact alpha for which we can basically have really high confinement times. And uh, we sort of like started out by like trying to know what actually happens when you add like small alpha and like the field is still like retains like the structure why that happens and now we know why that happens and now we also know like why what's like the exact alpha for which like the field lines are like sort of opens up and like there's like this new bifurcation etc etc and so we now have like a much more much much more stronger grasp on like why FRC works so that's basically like uh, so I guess I have five minutes to go through like the proofs uh, but the I, I, yeah, sure. Okay, so let's see. Like, let's see if you can like go through that. I mean, time does not always translate into understanding. 
Yeah. Okay, so. But yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so point or half theorem is basically you take like all those like critical points, and if you uh, let's say you have like a manifold M, and in that manifold there's like a lot of like critical points, right? And every critical point have like this number associated with them. It's called like their. Uh, Are they critical points of what? Some function? Yes, any function. That's like the beauty of it. Like this thing holds for regardless of like all. A, like a scalar function, not a vector function. It can also hold for vector function. So, um, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, just from one manifold to another manifold. Yeah. Basically, you like that's like the heavy ball theorem. Like you guys remember why like a ball needs to have at least two nodes. You can basically prove it using that. Like you have uh, this. <coughs> you have like a star. Uh, you have like this manifold called like sphere, and you basically write down like the vector in no matter what, how many ways you like write them down, you always have like at least, you at least need two critical points for like this equation to work. And uh, this thing here is basically like a character, uh, sort of like Euler, Euler characteristic of like the manifold. So a uh, sphere has two. Uh, if, you, if like a torus has like a zero or something like that, uh, the, yeah, because like Zenos is like one. So the, the, this thing, like you don't, you guys don't need to know like how to calculate that. Just know that like this thing exists, and we can use that, skip all that, and prove this. And what is this? This basically like beside, I'm like sort of like running out of time. So this basically shows that uh, if you have like number, like the number of maximum critical point in like a system, like uh, uh, so if you have like a in like a flat surface, you have like this magnetic field line. And like you have this number of uh, maximum critical points here, and this number of minimum critical points here, and this number of saddle points inside. So they must fulfill like this equation. So you can sort of use that to create like all these contradictions that that will be helpful, right? So let's say like you have like two critical points in like a system, like that are like both local maxima. You know that that the, you cannot really draw a closed magnetic field lines around it, right? Because that will violate this because number of local maxima and number of local minima. There are like two number of zeros, so two doesn't equal to one. So you can sort of use that to calculate and like sort of manipulate all these like things by creating like sort of like interesting contradictions. So um, do I have time? Uh, so the lemma one is basically if a contour intersects like a separator line or is like tangent to it, then then it can only be like the ellipse described in like the equation. You can sort of find it by solving like the phi, chi equal to zero, and see that uh, except if it's not like the ellipse, then it has to be this, like separate line, so it's not. And is it because that if you have two different curves at one point, then that, the day is there, so there are two different magnetic things at that point? Yeah, it's sort of. Like, I, yeah, I guess two minutes, let's see. We're going to like run super fast like this. Uh, Second is that uh, if like an open contour intersects like the ellipse, described in like equation 18, like the, like remember that sort of ellipse, then it can only be like a separate line. Because if it's like uh, sort of intersecting, then it has like points in common, right? And if it has points in common, then it becomes that ellipse, but we assumed it's not like that ellipse because that ellipse is like closed. So it has to be like the other thing that has like the same chi. What, what is like the other thing that has like the same chi? The separate line, chi equals zero, exactly. And like, uh, Lemma three for alpha greater than alpha naught. So we can basically use this to already prove like the first two theorems. So let's actually see. Uh, all contours except like a separate line with like the ellipse are closed. So let's assume that there is like an open contour, which is not the separate line inside the region enclosed by like the ellipse. Now that like the contour is like open, it must extend to infinity at somewhere, right? Because it's open, and uh, and sort of like it has to intersect like the ellipse at somewhere. Like because uh, we don't actually have like the spiral thing because it's like sort of like shy, and like shy has like actual algebraic like mo motion to it, and we can basically use like the lemma that we like proved like the second lemma to show that it can only be like a separate line, but we already said that it's not like a separate line, so it's like a contradiction. So like the first theorem is proved. The second theorem for alpha for small enough alpha such that two local maxima exist within like the ellipse of like equation 18, all contours outside of like the ellipse has to be like open. Now we're going to use that like the pointer half theorem. So let's say like there is, is like a closed contour outside of like the ellipse. What are like the possibilities? The closed contour, like the, any closed contour has to contain some critical point, right? Like it must. Like otherwise, like uh, like the derivative like doesn't make any sense. Like 
You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you can like basically shrunk it and like it will have like actually defined like non-zero like if derivative. So let's say like the closed counter doesn't actually contain two local maxima inside like the ellipse. So the closed counter without any critical point inside is impossible. So like the counter contains at least one critical point outside of like ellipse, right? So outside of like the ellipse, there's only like one digital uh, degenerate critical points on like separate line. So the closed counter must intersect by the separate. I'm like basically reading through. So, like, like, uh, and like due to lemma one, it can only be like ellipse. Like uh, we already like proved like lemma one, right? So if it's like only an ellipse, it's, then it's not actually outside of like ellipse. That's the contradiction. So it cannot happen. So like the second possibility, the close close counter contains like a two local maxima inside like ellipse, right? So even if, like if it's like contains like a two local maxima, then it must intersect like it must contain like the ellipse itself and it also must contain like the separator line because like the separator line is within like the ellipse at this time. So if it actually like, what's like the lemma two says? If it, uh, or lemma one. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, like so basically like, it basically leads to like same type of like, contradiction because of like lemma one. If like a closed contour intersects like the separator line, then it can only be like the ellipse, which again like not possible. So both of these things are like not possible. So the theorem is like proven now. Hold on. Do we have, uh, I think like, uh, should I go through it? Like, it's going through. I don't know, what do people think? Because at this point, I feel like it's, I'm not actually like. I think just like, uh, maybe just wrap it up, yeah? Because yeah. Uh, if somebody wants uh, the theorems proven in gory details, uh, well, we'll share the slides as well. I also have like a paper I can like basically just send you to the city progress. It's like much more detailed. So yeah, I guess so in two step first, C takes succeeds. Uh, does that mean we can uh, we can succeed in making a successful contained system for plasma? Is that the whole point of this? Just to hope things. Like if it succeeds, then yes, but there's like a lot more like thing going on. Like it it's not even that like A first needs to succeed. There's like Q plus like we need to Plasma confinement is just the first step. After that, you need to drive up like the Q plasma to like a point where it's like really, you have like a really heated current in like the uh, system and like the system is like, you're, you essentially ha have to have like a really high temperature where like fusion is like sort of happening spontaneously. Even after that happens, like it's not done because you need electricity like on the room, right? So you, don't need just Q plasma greater than one. You need to Q plasma if you actually have to have like a viable like cis like place where you like actually have like a reactor. You have to have Q plasma bigger than ten. But we're sort of getting there. Like right now, because it's like possible because uh, one really good thing about like this toroidal system is that they scale rather beautifully. Like as I like say, like you can create energy that like sort of is like proportional with respect to like the volume, but like the energy you need to put into the system is like proportional to like the surface area. So at some point you can sort of like just make the thing much larger and like it will work. But uh, the thing about nuclear fusion is this, it's like always 20 years away. And the other thing is that uh, you, you basically discover one bifurcation and you sort of know how to like work with it. You see, like, even within the paper, I just, like, figured out how to deal with, like, one type of, like, uh, system instability. I found, like, two other, right? Like, in, like, the limitation of, like, the system. So, it's, like, the problem with, like, the toroidal structure is that there's, like, so many, like, internally hidden uh, instabilities that, like, we, we know that, like, at some point we're going to catch all of it. But... So far, no matter like what we're like doing, it's like something is like sort of like the that's like another thing that's like promising on like AFRC is that like it has relatively really low amount of uh, instabilities because we're not relying on like this uh, sort of helical like structure like in like actual tokamak you have like this MHD and like then there's like sort of like helical magnetic field that's like going around the toroidal structure and that's like something you cannot really like fully control. And like that's sort of like creates problem. FRC that's like not there, but FRC is like too early to like talk about. It's like uh, in case of like tokamak and like all these things, people have been working on it since like 1940s. FRC like I guess like it's 20 years. I guess like if 20 years ago there was like some like wave of like research that was like happening in FRC. A couple of years ago like it's again like sort of like started because like the FRC was like able to like sort of demonstrate like really high beta factor, and so. 
It's promising, but like, uh, it's not something, how do like, we shouldn't like just sort of assume that, oh, like in five years we're gonna like just have this like thing working. But here's the hoping, like, right now like the thing is like, the thing that like we are sort of like exploring here is another like, it's just like PFRC, like, I was like, when I was like working in PPPL, I was basically working with like PFRC2 and like PFRC3 uh, systems. Right now there's like even more developments that happening, like we're working with like PFRC4 and like, uh, so there's like continuous like developments that's like happening that's like is not really talked about in like the media because media like I guess like there's like sort of like two trains of thought in like uh, about like uh, fusion research in media it's like either overly optimistic or it's like either overly pessimistic but like the sort of like report of gradual progress that's happening is happening. It's so the basic Now here, there's like a beauty of FRC, like the interference on outside doesn't affect FRC that much. Because there's like sort of like energy barrier. The problem with FRC is like the internal RNA. So that's like a perturbation in and of itself that like we're sort of like injecting. So it makes the whole thing unstable. It doesn't, like that's like, it. one of them does. Like event parity, if we use like the event parity uh, RMF, then it would have. But we sort of discovered that odd parity doesn't. And like we sort of like showed that up to like a really high range of uh, alpha, like this particular number. This is not like just fairly small. Like this is like a really high number when you like actually calculate it. Like you saw like it's 0 0.55, which means like you can have magnetic, uh, for like this setting for example, like look here. See like it's essentially 0 0.5471 for like this system. That's a really high number. Like you're doing half the Yes. It's essentially half of like the baseline like magnetic field. So like that's that's promising. You can you have like this really huge range of like safe uh, RMF where you can rotate the current and like the system can still be like uh, super stable. So how is that perturbation? Yes, but this that's like what I'm like saying. It's not even just like uh, FRC is <coughs> stable not even at like the level of perturbation. It's like stable at like an actual high range of RMF. So like our alpha need not even be like, like like fairly small. Like it's like alpha can be fairly high at some level where it's like, as you like say, how is that even like perturbation at that point? That's like the inter beauty of FRC. That like it's not even like, like the, at the level where you can still have like the system intact, it's not even like a small perturbation anymore. It's like, Yes. Okay, so I think uh, you know probably we should like end the talk, formal part of the talk, and thank Tausif. And after that, people can stick around and you know and uh, ask some questions. Uh, sorry, I have to be somewhere, so I have to.